Let's open the Word of God this morning from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. Um, I'll be preaching from 1 to 16, but uh, let's read up to verse 9 together, the Word of God. Let's read uh, responsively. <clears throat> In the third, <clears throat> excuse me. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youth with... <clears throat> the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. <clears throat> and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Let's read together. And God gave David Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Amen. This is the word of God. Um, it's a delightful time of the year, and uh, we get to start all over again the new year, right? As uh, we, we talked about, we have uh, Asian Chinese New Year. Um, so half of the world is in festivities and celebration of another year. Yet uh, also we you hear of the sad news of the uh, um, coronavirus epidemic, and uh, people are in fear. Uh, people in China, Yuhan, province, a city rather, and I've, I've been told that uh, you know, 20 million people are under travel van, and they're supposed to, that's like the biggest time of migration, people travel all, the, all over um, in China to celebrate uh, festivities, holidays, but because of the uh, virus, because of the corona uh, pneumonia, people are restricted and there's fear. And there are incidents, as you've probably heard in the news, that uh, incidences in South Korea, Tokyo, and, and Canada also. I heard a third incident in the US uh, just today. And uh, it's scary because we don't have an antivirus. We don't have a cure. They're still working on the uh, vaccine to, to uh, stop this uh, epidemic. And so we find um, people in China, people in Asia, they're running to the convenience store to buy these masks, right? To protect themselves. Because there's harm in the world, in the environment, in the circumstance, you know, where we live. We have to uh, really equip ourselves, guard ourselves, protect ourselves from this virus that we have no defense against. Um, the virus is something that we cannot see, and we are aware of it, and we are protecting ourselves. But we must not forget we, there is also something that's unseen that is even more uh, peril and per uh, more dangerous, and that is the virus of sin, right? All over the world. If we open our spiritual eyes, we see that we live in a very sinful, defiled culture and world where holy people of Jesus Christ. People who have been sanctified, who have been cleansed by the blood of Christ are still living on this earth and we are exposed to the sins, 
of every day. And uh, you and I are infected, affected by this sin, even though we are saints in Christ. We sometimes get angry at circumstances and we heat, uh, lay our heat on our family members without our intention. Sometimes we like to grumble and complain with our lips and with our hearts of the situation. We want to acknowledge God, that God is our Lord in our, in our life. Jesus Christ is my Lord, but we find ourselves so many times ourselves being the Lord and trying to command and ma manage everything in our lives. We find ourselves being under the influence of sin. Now, we cannot escape this world, right? We cannot get away from this world that God has put us in. Does that mean that we have to be like that monkey statue in, in um, Chinatown, three monkeys? You know, see, hear, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Do we uh, shut our lives out from the sinful culture and generation of this world? What is our, our remedy? What is our pre equipment and preparation? We need to have a spiritual, so to speak, mask on our lives. We need to be equipped spiritually in order to block out, filter the sin, the effects of sin in our world. We are going into the Gospel Project series this uh, spring from today. And the first message is from the, the book of Daniel. Uh, this, uh, these boys, these young men who lived in a very pagan culture and society as people of God. How did they block out? How did they resist the uh, secular, the paganistic, idol-worshiping culture that they were forced to live in? We want to get some spiritual insights from this beautiful story. And the topic we want to, the question we want to ask and answer is, uh, how can we, what is the basis for our holy living? How can we live holy lives? What is our energy for holy living in this world? We find two from the passage that we read uh, in the book of Daniel. The first is this, that we need to remember who we are. We remember our holy identity. We get to wear this spiritual mask to block out the sin that is affecting us every day. We need to remember who we are. Can we say it together? Remember who you are. That's the first mask that uh, we want to wear spiritually. The background of the story is uh, it's uh, 600, about 605 BC when the Babylonians, especially Nebuchadnezzar, the king Nebuchadnezzar came and attacked, invaded Jerusalem. We find that in verse 1. And it was during the reign of Jehoiakim, one of the last kings of the kingdom of Judah. And uh, they were besieged. And tragedy happened, right? They fell. The city fell. Of course, the entire, the total destruction of the city will happen uh, many years later, 587 BC to be exact. But this was probably about 605, one of the first uh, invasions. And at this time, young men from the, the elite the, the promising young men were taken away, taken away from the city of Jerusalem to Babylon. And we find in verse 2, uh, the Lord gave Jehoiakim of Judah into his hand. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon king's hand, with all the vessels of the house of the Lord, he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And along with them, in verse 3, uh, both Israel, uh, people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish and good appearance. These kids, these young men who had potential, who were of noble blood, were taken into the palace of the Babylonian king for his service. If you kind of think about it, it's like these young men <clears throat> who were living in the small capital city of Jerusalem. And now they're exposed all of a sudden to this vast culture, this metropolitan culture. A lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of markets, a lot of uh, everything, values. They're exposed to this, uh, another whole new world. And they're overwhelmed like a tsunami. They don't know how to deal with it. They were exposed to Babylonian culture. They were in fact forced to learn the culture. They were forced to learn the language. They were even forced to, um, they were given what to eat. They were to eat from the table of the king. The meat, the vegetable, the fruit, and the wine from the king's table. But uh, what was most devastating was they, ha they were forced to change their names. The Babylonian people were in fact trying to rip them off, rip them of their 
Israelite as their the holy people uh, identity and give them new identities. We find that the Bible tells us who these young men were. Uh, they are actually mentioned. Four of them are mentioned in verse seven. In uh, verse. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, verse 6. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These were beautiful Jewish names because they all had meaning, right? Daniel meant, God is my judge. He is my righteous one. That's what, what, what it meant, the name went. Also, Hananiah meant, God is generous. God is gracious to me. Also, Mishael meant that, who is like God? No one is like God. He is unique. He is so good to me. That's what it meant. Uh, Azariah means God is my helper. These beautiful Jewish names that reflect the goodness and the graciousness of God. They, bear, they bore this name and they were proud of their identities. But the Bible specifically tells us what these names were changed into. Verse 7. Daniel, uh, he received the name of Belshazzar. What a weird name, Belshazzar. It means uh, this, uh, this person is, uh, O wife of God, Baal, protect the king. That's what it meant, means. Belshazzar means uh, uh, wife of Baal. Mrs. Baal, protect the king. That was what it meant. And also, to, uh, it also gave the name of Shadrach. It means it is the command of Aku, the moon god. So you are under the command of Aku, Shadrach. Meshach, meaning what is, who is like Aku? And also Abednego means servant of the god Nebo. So imagine these holy godly names were turned into, converted, were forced to change to these idol names, to these gods of, of moon and of, 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 of harvest and God of uh, life. They were, they were changed. These names were, were uh, defiled and uh, they were humiliated and they were given these names that uh, praise the name of these false gods, these idols, that, the things that we see on this earth. This all happened in Babylon. In the Bible, whenever Babylon is mentioned, it it uh, usually signifies something that a force that goes against God, that rebels against God. We've been reading, uh, if you've follow, if been following the daily quiet time scripture in Genesis, and we find the, the descendants of Noah, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the people, uh, yes, the descendants of Noah come to the Shinal uh, plains and they build a tower of Babel. Babylon, Babel. And uh, it is in defiance, rebellion against God. No more flood. We can build something that reaches to the heaven with our own might. Let's build this big city. Let's build skyscrapers. Let's build an empire. Uh, and uh, we will not experience this divine wrath again. So it was an arrogant uh, project and God uh, crumbled it up. He, he uh, disassembled the entire people. We also find today, in you know, Babylon, there were always the people against God, the God's people, and they destroy the Holy Land, take people away to captivity, and they enslave them. We find also in the book of Revelation, Babylon is uh, a symbol of, uh, of adultery, right? The, the, uh, the wicked Satan, demons, who always tempt the people of God to commit adultery in the world, and all worldliness, all ungodliness. Uh, the word Babylon signifies all that in the book of Revelation. So throughout the Bible, we see the word Babylon attached to the enemy of God. And even today's story, the, the four young men, the four boys, were under the influence, the cultural, the language, and politics, economics, everything. They were under the influence of Babylon that was against God. Again, the purpose of Babylon was to strip them away of their holy identity as people of God. Throughout centuries, Satan has used the same tactic to, to diminish the identity and to uh, assimilate holy people into the secular culture. We find Jesus being attacked as well. If you have your Bibles, you can open to Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was tempted by the evil one as he was starting his public ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, verse uh, 8 to 10, I'll read this for us. 
And this is the third temptation uh, by the devil onto Jesus. And in verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world <coughs> and the glory. And he said to them, him, all these I give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Look at the content of the temptation. Satan was saying, I'll give you this Babylon, all the glories and riches and honor, the fame. I will give all this to you. You can assimilate and you will be famous in it. You will be renowned in this Babylon. One condition, you worship me. If you assimilate yourself, get, uh, put down your identity as the Son of God. Stop worshiping God the Father. Worship me, and I will give all this to you. There will be nobody that goes against you. You will not go against the culture. You will be the culture. You will be recognized in the world. Satan was trying to assimilate Jesus into uh, his kingdom. But Jesus, he knew that he was different from the world. Jesus knew that he was different from Babylon. So he says, I don't worship you or the world. I worship the Lord. That's what the scripture says. Worship only Yahweh God and him alone. And he was able to defeat, win over this uh, temptation. That's what it means to be holy, to be different, to be separated. Saying that I'm not one of you. I am not of you. Jesus knew that he was not of the world. He had nothing to do with the Satan. And because of his confirmation and his assurance of his identity as the Son of God, as the one who worships Father God, he was able to stand firm. He was able to wear a mask of holiness before the adversary. Brothers and sisters, the first lesson that we can learn from this passage of how we could... Um, continue to live in, in holiness is that we need to remember our holy spiritual identities. Remember your holy identity. Although the uh, text today is not very detailed, it's not very you know, clear about uh, how these friends of Daniel, Daniel and his friends, had this holy identity in God, we see that Daniel, who wrote this book, he records their, their Hebrew names intentionally, saying that my name means who is like God. My name, my name means God is my helper. My, my name means God is my judge. They were proud. They had this identity. They had this spiritual root in God. And that's what, they kept, what kept them from assimilating, uh, assimilating into the Babylonian secular culture. For us Christians, we have our identity in Jesus Christ. That's why Peter, Jesus' disciple, says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I'll read it for us, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter reminds who, us who we are. We are a sacred nation. We are chosen people called out from the darkness to shine his glorious and marvelous light to the world. Just as f for us to bear holy fruit in our lives, we need holy root. We need, the, we need to be rooted in our, the identity of our, our, our being should be rooted in Jesus Christ in order to bear the fruit of Christian life of holiness. And that's why we have this worship service, to remind ourselves who we are in Jesus Christ. That's why we have the Bible study, to remind each other that you are not alone, that we are here together, brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ. And Daniel and his friends, holy friends, they were together. They were a holy club, so to speak, reminding each other. Maybe they worship together. Maybe that Bible study together in Babylon that we are holy people of God. One more application I want to suggest is uh, not just should we be holy, should we have our holy identity in Jesus Christ, but we must not forget that we must remind our kids to have identity as Christian Christ followers. You know, at the beginning of the month, <clears throat> I talked to somebody on the street 
And uh, I said, uh, you know, I'm from Cornerstone Church, and we're here to bless, you know, and pray for people and uh, ask for this young man's name. He was like early 20s, I thought, and uh, I think. And his name was Aaron. And he also told me, I'm a Jewish person. What does that mean? Usually it means that, you know, go away. I don't want to talk about Jesus. But, you know, for, for some reason, God gives me this compassionate heart for for Jewish people, because those people are people loved by God. They're all over the Old Testament, and uh, God will fulfill his promise to the, old, the uh, Jewish people. It will be fulfilled someday. So I had this compassion for this young man. Said, I said, wow, what a beautiful name you have. Did you know your, your name is so important? The, the name Aaron. Aaron was the priest, the first priest of all the Jews. And God blessed your tribe, the, Jewish, uh, the, uh, uh, the Levites, to uh, be a priest nation, to, to be a priest tribe to everybody else. You are very special. And you can see his eyes open up because he, he heard it for the first time. He never knew the name of his meaning, uh, meaning of his name. And he had a big smile. And uh, I was trying to talk about God a little bit more, but he had to go. But that was the end of the conversation. But it saddened my heart to find a person who has a holy name, Aaron, who has the name but has no spiritual identity attached to that name. But also think about, not, not about Aaron, the guy in the street, but our kids. Among our kids, there are Johns, there are Matthews, there are Andrews, there are Pauls, Davids. Someday, they will leave our care. Right? They'll go to college. Maybe some of them will have already left your, your care, your empty nest. But regardless, our kids will someday leave us. And uh, can we be certain that they have their spiritual identity, holy identity in Jesus Christ? One day, if you not haven't already, you will probably pack your van with all their belongings, their, their clothes, their books, and uh, maybe some uh, small appliances to be taken to the dorm. And uh, you're trying to have everything ready for them. And in the center of your heart, you're also wondering, do they have the identity as Christian? Am I sending them off? My kid, my son and daughter, uh, am I sending them off with a strong, firm root in Jesus Christ? Will they be able to withstand the culture of Babylon as they go to college, as they hear diverse culture, di diverse values and philosophies and, and uh, uh, many, many things in life? Will they be able to stand as holy people of God? We need to constantly remind our kids of their holy identity in Jesus Christ. What I described is something that I imagine with my kids. That's why I, I pray for them every night before they go to bed. Uh, I lay hands on their head or their back. I pray this prayer that God, thank you for keeping my son or daughter safe today. You are the one. You are the one who has kept them safe. Father God, give them faith in you, to trust in you that you will also provide for them tomorrow. God, give them the faith to know that you are the God of their life. Every opportunity, I try to remind them that their identity is in Jesus Christ. Every other uh, ground is sinking sand, but only Jesus Christ, the firm foundation, eternal foundation that never changes. He is the risen Son of God. He has proven himself to be God. And only that foundation is firm. Brothers and sisters, we might not have that many years with our kids, if you have small kids, younger kids. But uh, the reason that God shows us this this morning in the book of Daniel, these holy boys, is maybe to challenge us. How will my kids stand in the culture of Babylon today, in 2020 this year, or in the years to come? Let us constantly remind the kids of our identity in Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons that we're doing these uh, early morning prayer on Saturday morning, once a month. So at least let's do it together as a family. Let's just come together to hear the word of God together and to pray for them and remind them once again that they belong to Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God. And in fact, that was the foundation that Daniel and his friends had, and they were able to stand as holy people of God in a very paganistic, idol-worshiping culture. But there's a second spiritual mask that they were wearing. They remembered what God had done in their lives. The second is, let us remember 
not only who we are as holy people of God, identity in Christ, but let also, let's also remember what God has done, the good things, the gracious things that God has done in our lives. In verse 8, we find Daniel making this resolution, this, this, this leap of faith, so to speak. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. This is a bold, dangerous move by Daniel. He was about to stick out among all the other boys, all the other boys from different cultures and kingdoms. He was about to stick out, be a thorn to the one who was in charge of these boys. What was the issue here? Daniel and his friends were uncomfortable with the food that they were receiving. Now, we don't know for sure what was with the food, but because the text is not, does not go into detail. But many Old Testament scholars think that they were given food from the king's table, which meant that this, these foods were offered to idols, right? And so maybe some of the foods were defiled because not only they were offered to idols, but they were forbidden by Jewish culture and also the book of Leviticus. Uh, uh, Leviticus, yes. Uh, of, they were given pigs, so to speak, pork, bacon, you know. Uh, and uh, this was not something that the Jews would eat because they had this holy identity of the people of God. And so they were uncomfortable. And Daniel, he wanted to express his difference. I am not like that. I cannot assimilate with this world. So he makes this bold suggestion that, Mr. Manager, um, would you give me the chance to prove myself? Give me 10 days, me and my friends, 10 days, and test us. We'll not eat from the king's meat or the wine, we'll only eat the vegetables and also the water, just the water, and test us how we look, our appearance after 10 days. And so uh, God was generous with Daniel, and he gave grace to the eunuch that was in charge of Daniel. And verse 9 says, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs, and uh, they were put to the test. And after 10 days, as you know, their face was shining, you know. It was, uh, you know, fattened. It looked really good and nice and pretty. And so you can do whatever you want. Yes, let's continue to have this uh, diet that you want to have. And they were able to preserve themselves from defiling their, their body uh, by eating detestable food. What is the, the morale? What is the lesson of this story? Does it mean that we all have to go on a you know, vegetarian diet now? We have to be vegans? Let's not make that application. I, I, I love me. <laughs> of course, it does not mean that. Uh, but it probably means that we need to be different. And we can be different from the world. Let's go to our original question. What is the motivation that gives us this holiness, this resolve to be different, to be holy? As we see in Daniel's life, we see a hint of what was going on in the back of his mind. In verse 9, let's go back to verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. This word favor is a very beautiful word. This word grace is very beautiful. Either favor or grace, depending on the Bible. It's a very beautiful word because the word is hased in Hebrew. And you've probably heard the word hased before. It means loving kindness. It means grace of God. It means that something that God gives you for free because he's good. It means blessing of God. Daniel probably remembered all the good things that God had done for him, even when he was in Jerusalem. How in the turmoil of the nation, when they were being attacked, God preserved him and his friends. How God brought him to Babylon, and yet he was able to meet people who are so nice to him. He was protected. He, was, he felt the loving, kind hand of God. He was... Uh, he was uh, uh, cared by all these eunuch and people of God. And as he remembered the goodness of God, God, what God had done in his life, he was able to make a bold forecast, a resolve. I will not. I shall not defile myself by eating these things that does not please God. God has been good to me, and I will live a holy life. That love, that grace, what God has done in his life became a power, an energy, a motivation for him for, to live a holy life. 
Just as a baby, when it uh, gets gains strength, it becomes it begins to crawl, and when it crawls, it begin it, it uh, gains uh, muscles to be able to walk, and as it begins to walk, maybe in later life, it could even run a marathon. Marathon. Daniel and his friends, they, through the small good things of God in their lives, what God had provided for them, how God had pro protected him, how God had been good to them, through these spiritual muscles of experiencing God's goodness in his life, in their lives, they were able to make this bold resolve to live holy lives. Brothers and sisters, are our lives similar? As we look at our past, we cannot but acknowledge that every step of our lives has been a gift from God. As we look back at the road that we've uh, tread, the bricks that have been laid on, uh, behind us have been the gracious step of God every step of the way. Like the, 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 the poem, Footprints in the Sand, we thought we were the one that carried our life and led our life. But we realized that Jesus has, had carried us his feet was the one that carried us, not ours. And he protected us, and he led us. He is, in fact, the Ebenezer God, God who has led us thus far. And the most amazing grace in our lives was, in one point in our lives, God gave us the faith to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And he gave us the, the faith to trust him that he forgave all our sins. All our sins have been paid once for all, Perfectly, and we are eternal in the, uh, living as sons and God in the eternal kingdom of God. We have a heaven assured for us. And we have that, that has said, that grace that, that keeps us going. And based upon that goodness of God, we also are able to make this bold, holy challenge, saying that regardless, I will live for God. I will live differently from the world because we have these victories these grace, these gifts from God. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you and challenge you to choose to live holy lives this year. It is a choice. It is a resolve. It is a resolve to develop a holy habit that the world does not understand. <clears throat> is there a holy habit that you need to um, pick up this year as you live as people of God? As, you, as one who has experienced the grace of God. What is the Babylon like that we're living today? Obviously, there's no, <clears throat> sorry, a dictator like Nebuchadnezzar who is forcing us to wear worldly clothes or eat the world, worldly you know, food. But I believe we live in, in a digital Babylon age. Digital Babylon. Maybe you've heard of the a phrase FOMO, Fear of missing out. You know, you are forced, you are bullied, maybe, to know what's going on in the news. You have to know the latest news or you'll be falling behind. You have to know the latest trend. You have to know the latest, you know, education for your kids. You have to know the latest tech, the device. The world is pressuring us to conform to its own culture, its habit, to assimilate, to become part of its like own. Being competitive, being... Uh, part, being part of the machine of the world. But you have the strength, the challenge to say, no, I am different. I do not live for the world. I'm not pressured by the bully of the digital era. I'm not pressured by social media or the internet. And if you live like that, you will feel like a foreigner, maybe an exile living in your own homeland. A spiritual exile where people look at you in a strange way. That was the secret of Daniel's success. He did not live according to the custom of Babylon, assimilated with everybody else, eating the same thing and wearing the same thing, although he was given a, a Babylonian name. He resolved himself to give his life to holiness, holy kind of living. That's why I titled my sermon this morning, um, holy boys, holy boys. In Korean, I titled it uh, When I talked about 소년단, somebody said, oh, that reminds me of another 소년단. Uh, 방탄 소년단, if you know Korean. BTS, sounds like BTS. Oh, really? Holy boys, BTS. Okay, okay, so I changed it. Not BTS, but 
GTS, let's be GTS, right? God's titanium, <laughs> the God's titanium boys. That's what we need today in order to resist, in order to live in this world that is so prevalent of sin, to live as holy people of God. I'm so proud of our, some of our youth students who are part of the National, um, National Christian Club. They, we meet here at church. They meet here at church every Thursday to pray for their church middle school here. And uh, they are Christians. They live a different kind of life. I'm so proud of our youth students. I'm so proud of you for being here on Sunday morning, turning off your screens, your cell phones, your email messages, and devoting this time to God. It is a holy thing to God. Who else in the world does that? Who else gives an hour or two to worshiping God. This is a statement, a proclamation that we want to live holy lives. It is like Daniel resolving to be holy. Brothers and sisters, I pray that all of you, I know you do, but let's resolve to prioritize this worship before the Lord this year. Let us make it a habit of, of gathering in a holy gathering as we meet for Bible study, as we have small group meetings. These are something that uh, the world does not understand. Why do you guys study the ancient Bible? What does it have produced in your life? It doesn't make money. It, you're wasting your time. The world will see. We'll see. They do not understand. But this is the holy habit that we can have in order to live beyond this world. We haven't read to the end of the chapter, but we find that God blesses Daniel and his friends, and God gives Daniel and his friends Wisdom tenfold more than all the other boys, right? God gave them wisdom beyond average human wisdom and create, uh, creativity. That's what we seek for. We don't want the blessing of this world, just average normal day Joe and, you know, just succeed, succeed in our, our corporate ladder. We want to live in a godly standard, live a holy, a different, a separate lifestyle that not only benefits us, but benefits the people around us. In fact, to show them that there is life, eternal life, in Jesus Christ. And that's what holy living means. Brothers and sisters, GTS people, let us commit to this holy living, knowing that we are holy people rooted in Jesus Christ. Knowing that God has been gracious all this time, and he will continue to bless us as we live for holy things. Not assimilating with the culture, but living, sticking out in the culture as a Daniel, as a holy sister and brother of Christ. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer as we.